Hello, my name is Ran, and this is the Flow Artist Podcast. Every episode, my co-host Joe Stewart and I speak with inspiring movers, thinkers, and teachers about how they find their flow and much, much more. I hope you are well. You might be able to tell my voice is a little bit croaky, but I have a bit of a cold, which is why this episode's coming out a little bit late. I got the COVID test and that came back negative, which is what I expected, but it's still a bit of a relief. Now, I have been looking forward to this episode for quite a while. It's an episode with Phil Kayumba. Phil is a yoga teacher based in Melbourne and he's got just an incredible story, which I think he can tell far better than I, so I won't give too much away. But please be advised, Phil's family have been heavily affected by the political violence in his home country of Rwanda, which he shares about in this episode. So just a little bit of a content warning there. This episode was brought to you by our sponsor, Yoga Australia, registering teachers and training courses to ensure that everyone in Australia has access to quality yoga teachers. All right, that's more than enough from me. Let's get into our conversation with Phil Kayumba. All right, Phil, thank you so much for coming and meeting with us today and speaking with us. It's great to finally get the chance to speak with you. Perhaps you could just start by telling us a little bit about your background and where you grew up. Yeah, of course. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, I've always been a big fan of you two, and now uh, being in your presence is really heartwarming. No, oh, thanks, Phil. Yeah, so, so I thought I'd get that you. out of the way first because <laughs> it's really, really vital. I say that. So, as far as where I come from and who I am, I was born in Uganda, but I'm actually from Rwanda. And the reason being is that my family were refugees in Uganda and had been for about two generations. And so my father moved back to Rwanda as a refugee rebel. And during that really tumultuous period in African history, the 80s and the 70s and the early 90s, there was a lot of rebel movement going on. And it was about self-determination and about the concept of going back to where they came from. There's a lot of history to that. So if, if anyone's interested, you can kind of go down the history of Rwanda and what that means is too big for us to go down. And then I uh, moved to Rwanda when I was really, really young, four years old, and experienced quite a lot shortly before the end of the genocide and after the genocide in Rwanda. And from that point onwards, I lived in Rwanda until I was 10. And then I was granted the opportunity or to play soccer in the United Kingdom. African kids, you know, soccer is a huge part of our lives. So I was very, very lucky um, that I had the opportunity, also the ability um, for my parents to be able to pay for a ticket to send me, which probably was a bit of a sacrifice, but I think they saw promise in, in my dream and my capability to achieve it. And I left my family for the first time at 10, which was really, really daunting. Like every time I say it, I go back and I think, oh, my goodness. So, but I think it was the beginning of a sense of independence. I um, then moved to the United Kingdom for about six or so months and played soccer, football, wherever you come from. <laughs> <laughs> and then I incurred an injury in, on my ankle. And the notion that I was there was predicated on the fact that I needed to play. And if I couldn't play, I couldn't be there any longer. Um, it just happened to coincide with my father's arrival in the country. And he'd also got a scholarship to study at the Royal Military College in Shrivenham, which is not far from Swindon, which is not far from Oxford, <laughs> really small towns. And I lived there for another year with my dad and went to a, just a normal school, community college called Farringdon Community College. And then a year later, my father finished his master's and went back to Rwanda. But then he sent me to a military college called Michael House in South Africa. I think the reason for that is he always felt that I was, I lacked direction. I was always a bit of a dreamer. My teachers were always like, oh, you know, Phil's not a bad kid, but you could pay attention more. And I always found that to be a bit of a crux because my parents were always going, can't you pay attention? Can't you pay attention? And sure enough, I wanted to, but I just couldn't. So I think my father sent me down to South Africa it was a bit of a, an opportunity to get me on the narrow and straight path, but also because he's a military man. So only rational that he makes that decision. In hindsight, now I see why. But at the time, I was very frustrated. Did you find it hard? Difficult, very, very difficult. And it's something that still brings up less so 
but over the last few years, it's brought up, brought up as a way to kind of cathart those feelings with my parents. And they brought up a lot of tension on both sides, but still a lot of results in terms of recognizing what they could have done differently, but also for me to rationalize their people who made mistakes. And those mistakes bore some fruit nonetheless, because I'm the person that I am now because of those decisions. And uh, then I moved to South Africa and went to the school that was very, very strict, uh, military precision, boys military school, and it wasn't easy. I lost a lot of my ability to be sensitive during that period of my life. So from the age of 12 to 15, I spent that school and I'd go back to Rwanda intermittently to see my family during the whole long holidays. And there was a bit of a distance. So I'd go back and I'd isolate myself and then I'd go back and and then I'd yearn being with my family. So it was a bit of a catch-22. I'd want to be with my family and I'd go back and I'd be angry with them. And then I'd come back and I'd miss them. So it was a really, you know, like all teenagers, I was going through a bit of a emotional upheavals and so on. But it was hard to rationalize it with the context that I was in at the time. And also my father was an important person by this point, a really important person in the country but also had a lot of tension with the president. My father's always been a proponent for accountability, for you know justice. He's a studied lawyer, and he always emphasized that in our house. We ever had an issue, he'd sit us down and would have a bit of a home court kind of thing. Not always the best way to resolve issues, but it taught us how to be quite pragmatic and factual. And that issue, with him being that way, He's always been uh, very vocal, especially with the president, about term limits, assassination plots, and so on and so forth. And again, that's something you can you can research on if you want to in your own time. But as a result of that tension, my father was then made ambassador of Rwanda to India. And in most cases, that would sound like a great thing, which it was. But it was actually initially intended as a isolation tactic for our family. Get him out of the country type that's right. right. And get his influence, you know, to quell his influence in his absence. So they sent him to India and the rest of us along with him. And I'd only just kind of started to really get a rhythm in the school. I felt like I had a sense of, what I say, stature. And I also had a reputation that I'd, I'd kind of made in those years that I was there, although difficult, I had. And now I had to uproot and leave. And not even to go home, but to go to this foreign country, India. So when I was told, I had two weeks to prepare for that transition. And I wouldn't be able to to prepare for it with my family. I had to prepare for it while at school. And then I'd have at best a week or or less before I moved to India with my family. As always, I accepted the situation. I think at this point, acceptance had become a narrative in my life and still is. And I went with my family and moved to India in 2005. At this point, I was 15 and spent quite a while Again, with my family in close quarters, but more with my siblings, who I hadn't been around for a very long time either. So it was very strange having to play this big brother role when I hadn't been like a present big brother for so long. There was all this, there was this like nostalgia of big brothers coming home. There'd be that like romantic period of his coming home and I'd arrive, but the reality wasn't congruent with the expectation. So I'd arrive and I'd be like, you know, moody and, and shitty. And <laughs> they'd be like, where's that guy? You know, <laughs> the last few days, last week I was left, I'd, I'd leave. But this time I was here with them. I wasn't going anywhere. So India first was hard for us to climatize in as black people. The caste system there is very, very, very difficult to navigate. We find ourselves in a place of privilege, but didn't feel that way. So being the car, really nice car. And my father and my mother always taught us to be very humble. So just because you're riding in a good car doesn't mean that you got to treat people outside of it any any less. So whenever we're looking outside, at least personally, whenever I was looking outside the car, I'd make eye contact with somebody who had very little, I would try to look at them with a sense of empathy. And not necessarily joy or not something that would make them feel like I had more or I was looking down at them. And that's always been the person I am. I hate I feel for people really emotionally, even now I'm getting a little teary thinking about it. And you'd be traveling in the car and you'd be looking at these people with a sense of kindness and maybe a sense of humility and, and they would look at you and laugh, you know, and, and they would, they would sometimes throw things at the window or, you know, shout out words, 
Kalaban, which means black monkey. And as time progressed, obviously, I started to travel more outside of the narrative of the embassy. You know, I was a, as a teenager becoming a young adult, so I wanted to do things. Because I was a son of the ambassador, there was all these stipulations. You can't do this. You can't do that. And I felt really hemmed in. I was like, I'm in this new country. I'm not in the military. Any, like in that military kind of like, I wasn't per se in the military, but that kind of military um, setting where you had sergeants and people telling you what to do and you had drills and you had school and you had all that. And I thought, here's a sense of freedom perhaps that I could latch on to and learn something different. And it was hard because you'd be like, you can't do this, you can't do that. There's a reputation to uphold. You're not the ambassador, but you're still the ambassador's children. And I respect that. You know, we were representing a country. And also we had a, a role in terms of like, I suppose, respecting our parents and the mantle they were provided. So during that period, I was kind of, I had a decision to make, either become more of an angry person or kind of learn to let things go and be much more, some would say manipulative, but probably more cunning. Well, you're growing up around diplomacy, so, That's right. you know. <laughs> That's right. So I had to become, and the stories my dad was telling me at this point, my mom were about the politics back, back home and how people were being murdered extrajudicially and how family members were disappearing and and how the president was really out to get my dad. And, and he started off with just very simple things and he just escalated and escalated. So as a family, we banded together and we got closer and closer together because even within the embassy, we're always not particularly sure of who to trust and what it is that we're doing. And actually just a bit of a side note, a few months, a year ago or so, Rwanda was, a, a, there was a, a I think it was a, st- it wasn't a study, but it was a report that came out showing that Rwanda had the second highest number of foreign spies in Australia after China. And that's because there's a huge diaspora here in Queensland that is very vocal about the current president's actions and all that kind of stuff. So the Rwandan system is very much like North Korea, but like it is fueled by the money of foreign aid and sustained by public relation companies. So, you know, there's a great image about Rwanda and it's a, an economic hub, but all the locals are afraid and all the people outside are, are being killed with the use of the money of the, that should be going to the people. So it's a very, very almost futuristic, dystopic African state of kleptocracy. You know, and I use that word sparingly, but not in this case. It's not about a dictatorship or anything like that. It's about one person's image. By the time we understood this as a family, my mother and the president's wife had actually started a school when we still lived in Rwanda. And I had no more than a couple of weeks before I finished school, high school. And I'd kind of hunkered down on education. I thought, you know what? There's this notion that I'm a black kid and that I'm less or dumber or something like that. So I thought, I'm going to put my head down and I'm going to do my best academically so that I can leave, but also so I can show and prove something. I started mature enough to realize I didn't need to prove anything to anyone, but I think it motivated me to push through school quickly. And then I asked for a transfer to Australia and asked to La Trobe University, and I put through a bunch of applications, sorry, to, to uh, Bond University. And I always wanted to come to Australia, never to America, never to England. I already lived there and I hated the weather. The people are amazing, but the weather's horrible. <laughs> and I'm all about whether <laughs> if I have the choice, I'll make that choice. <laughs> Sounds fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> and so was it because you already knew that there was quite a Rwandan community in Australia that you wanted to come or what was the reason? Because I would be alone and I would, I'd, in fact, the decision to come to Australia was specifically the opposite of that because <laughs> there'd be no Rwandans here. <laughs> and I, I wanted, not that I have an issue with my countrymen, I love my countrymen, I love my country, but I wanted to get out and experience what the world had to offer outside of that, 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 that insulator of being a Rwandan, of being black, of being a man, of being everything that I am. How can I be tested to really like see through my own notions and my own values and see if they're really the right ones? And that's to expose myself. Whilst in India, though, I travel a little bit to the north of India. I was in Shimla and Rishikesh. I spent a lot of time in those areas and I first got exposed to hallucinogens at that point and started, you know, participating in, in rituals, kanja rituals with, you know, some Pandijis and gurus and, you know, people just sitting on the side of the road meditating. And I always had this 
this drive to always like go to people who are different. Even in school, when somebody seemed weird, those are the people I seemed to be gravitating to. Cause I was always like, you're clearly doing something different. Everyone else is going down this little path and they're afraid because what you're doing is different. I used to be like, let me go and find out if I can learn what this is. It really is. And I think that's who I am. So in India, after school, I kind of traveled the North and that's when I met yoga. And I say I met yoga because it was like, it felt like a person. It's like I got taught how to meditate, just a little bit of meditation, nothing, nothing grand, just how to sit and to notice what's going on. And that word to notice really made a big difference in my journey in yoga because I started utilizing it as a way to deal with my dysregulation. So when I get shitty or when I, when I get anxious or even when I get excited about something, because I realized sometimes in my excitement to do something that was fun or whatever would lead me astray. I wouldn't see things for what they were. And I'd jump in gung ho only to realize it probably wasn't for me. So, <laughs> and that was not a problem at well, as well, but there's some things I could, probably could have perceived weren't for me before I chose to dive in. Had I taken a moment to notice, I digress. So I lived uh, in India and did all this traveling. And I think that exposed me to finding a way to accept uh, people because I got called all sorts of things. You know, one village, people love you. Next village, they hate your guts. Next village, they love you. And that's what I love about India, to be truly honest. I could have said I hate it, but I love that about India because it's it's a million nations in one. Like you only need to travel for 100 kilometers before they're speaking what feels like a completely different language, but it's a different dialect. And the sense of expectation and and reality is so different in parts of India. Dark skin is loved here, but not in the next village, you know, because a certain God is, you know, and that that duality really allows you to accept things that you can't change, but also to, to lean into the things that you're enjoying. So you'd walk into a village and people are nice to you, you'd, you'd really get into it. But when people are really bad to you, you'd have to find a way to accept that and just move on without causing any issues. And I think practicing that over and over and over and over again as a black young boy or a young adult in, in India gave me a sense of fortitude, how to deal with racial abuse, how to deal with being black, how not to lean so much into my blackness and how to just to be Phil. I'm proud of my blackness and I fight for the rights of being black, but there's a time uh, and a place there was times where there was like a hundred people, like I couldn't start arguing then to turn that very bad out for me, you know? There's times in class where someone would say something that was very bigoted and I would stand up and have an argument in the middle of a class with an Indian kid and I'd say, you need to change the way you think because that's unacceptable. And I think living in India taught me that when process because it's so vital. A lot of people want to have good causes and have great reasons for what they're doing, but things fall short because of, not realizing when the when and that when I think became more more clear to me when I started to notice, right? So it was all became like this huge chain of things since that that yoga stuff. Got us an opportunity to come to Australia, and I left when I was seventeen, and I arrived here and started uni at La Trobe. Enjoyed my first year. I was doing law and economics because you know I was trying to make my parents proud. <laughs> <laughs> realize that's not who I am. I, two years in, but I learned a lot. I learned how to kind of defend myself, learned the very basics about how to keep myself safe, legally speaking, and it gave me a, a much more expanded vernacular, right? And then I thought, I want to work with people. I've always been a people's person. So I changed everything to HR and marketing. I wanted a degree. And I think there was this thing about it coming, growing up, my parents about degree, degree. And as much as now I'm like, yeah, degree, it's still in there, you know, like growing up your whole life, you're like, okay, I'm just going to get it so I can get it off my back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I got, I was just about a year in, so a year before I graduated, my father ran away from, from Rwanda. So he'd gone back for a meeting and he was tipped off that he was likely be imprisoned or assassinated after six, seven years of being ambassador. They'd wiped out his whole political base and all the people that agreed with his narrative that point, I was in my last year of uni here, and the Rwandan government decided to cancel my passport and my siblings. They locked my mother and my siblings in the embassy house in India for a week and a half, no access to anything really. They took away their passports in a foreign country, and then my father found himself in South Africa as a political refugee in 2010. At that point, I had to make a plan because now I was here and I was about to 
essentially be deported to a country that didn't want me and was probably going to kill me as a way to prove something to my father. So I decided to declare myself as a refugee at that point. But because I didn't have any paperwork, I couldn't go to school. My learning management system got cut off and I was in a bit of limbo. And then a month and a half later, my partner at the time told me she was pregnant. And I was like, okay, well, I made my decision. Like clearly, like my part is done. Like I, I can't, the only thing I can say is I'll support you. But as far as where we go from here, the choice is yours. You have this child, I'm with you for the rest of our lives. Not even if we separate, I'm there to support you for the rest of our lives. You choose not to have this child, I'll still respect and love you the same way because it's your body and I'm, yeah, you have to have that choice. Time went by and then the decision was made to keep Sevi, who is now nine. <laughs> my best friend. And that boy uh, taught me a lot, but we'll get to that later. (laughs) So I knew I was going to be a dad, but now I had to prepare to be a dad in a country where I had no right to work in. I had to finish uni after three and a half years of spending quite a lot of time and and effort and dedication. I thought I have to finish. So Jessica, Sevi's mom, and I made a decision that she would pause her education for, for a time and work casually if she could, and I would work and and study and finish and think whatever you want to God or the universe or intention or I managed to finish and graduated. And Sevi was born, I think, three, four months before I graduated. So I managed to organize things at the university and explain the situation and they were happy for me to do the everything I needed to. And once my visa was was declared, then they'd be able to kind of give me my degree and so on. So it was a good, really good compromise. And then my father was shot. So there was an assassination attempt on him during this period. Like this year was intense and he got shot. And then... Was he in South Africa? Yeah, during the World Cup. So it was in December. Sevi was born six months later, actually. So before Sevi was born, I found out my dad had run away. I found out I was going to be a dad. My dad was shot. And then my son was born. My dad survived. But in the year preceding that, there was five other assassination attempts. And they really wanted to get him out and they failed. And then my son, Sevi was born and just started doing jobs everywhere. Really, I've had all sorts of jobs. I've painted, I've cleaned toilets, I've, I've washed dishes, I've clipped trees, I've health signs. I've, there's no job below me. Even to this day, if tomorrow I couldn't sustain myself on yoga, I'd go do any other job with, with, with a sense of pride and my chin held high because it's a way to sustain yourself. And I think doing that and suffering a little bit sometimes gave me a sense of respect for hard work and, uh, and a sense of humility, knowing that no one is above anything. Even if you do well, you have to remind yourself of where you came from and where you could possibly return. So did all those jobs and they managed to sustain us just enough. I'd work during the day and then I would do the night routine with Sevi. So I would clean him at night, swaddle him, feed him whenever he'd wake up, go back to work in the morning. And I made that a, a, a thing to always be with my son every evening. So I'd emphasize with Jess, I'd be like, you're sleeping. Like every night you're going to get a full night's rest. I know I have to be at work. I can get bad sleep, but this is an opportunity for me to be with my child. And I may end up always working, you know, because that's the narrative I thought we were going to be in, you know, that usual nuclear family kind of stuff. And I think that's what we all kind of aspire to because that's what we're told was the right way to live. So I uh, did that. But as time progressed, Jess's mental health just deteriorated. Postnatal depression kicked in. I didn't know any of that stuff. I didn't know what it was remotely. And I'd wake up and she'd just be really upset. And I would think it was a, like a sense of entitlement. And I couldn't understand it because... He, Things that were happening back home were surreal. My dad's assassination attempts, my passport's gone. I'm having to go to, to you know, DFAT and immigration just to, to, to quantify that I'm here. And there's all these things that were happening in my lives and I have to work. And, and I, so I just couldn't find a place in myself to empathize with someone who'd wake up in the morning and just be like, I hate my life. When the bills were paid, despite all the things that were going on, the child was healthy, she was fine. And it was tough. It was a tough time for me to be able to empathize with her. And I can understand my role in, in make, probably have made making things worse at the time, probably because of I just didn't know better. And then 
yeah, things just kind of gradually got worse and worse. I go to work and I'd have to leave early and, and I'd start hating being at work because my managers would be like, you're undependable. And I'd be like, yeah, but you don't supersede my child. <laughs> and if you can't support me in that, well, that's your problem. And then they'd be like, well, so you probably have to consider leaving. And I'd be like, okay, cool. I'm gone. And I'd leave and go find another job. And so I ended up in call centers that really became a place I, I was working in. I was eloquent enough to have conversations and understood the lay of the land because I'd done the, that job quite a few times before I graduated. And then as time progressed, I found myself using yoga as a way to switch off from talking to people. So I'd be on the aisle on the phone and then I really wouldn't want out to go out and talk to my, the people I work with. I'd be like, I just want to switch off from human beings for a moment. So I started just kind of doing just stretches because my back would be hurting. And then I started remembering Surya Namaskar, you know, sun salutation. I started doing it every, for my 15 minute break. I was like, huh. And then I just started back into, inside getting to asana. So I, started, I got this app called Down Dog and I still use it today. So it's been years now. I just started doing this little by little and I started realizing in Shavasana and that's Shavasana that I would kind of disappear from everything. Sometimes I'd be like, you know, that wake up, start sucking air into your mouth. I'm like, what, what time is it? I'm like, I've been awake for six hours. I sleep for six hours. Just felt so good. And I'd be much more relaxed and I'd be so much more calm. And, and I also noticed that I was, I was reading things that were kind of in the narrative of, of mindfulness now. You know, the more I did it, the more it led me down the path of wanting to acquire knowledge about it. And then I met Rachel. Goldenberg, who's also a teacher and she's my partner and she's an amazing human being really like we we met and we happened to just both love yoga she was much more into it and she just come out of like a a really long marriage and a divorce and i just at this point jess had left had left me and left, left me and sevi for a little while because she's just finding it difficult i quit my job for for about four or five months and and was with Sevi full time. And she came back from Queensland and then moved out of the house. And I was left in this house and she left with Sevi. Keep in mind, I had no rights in this country. So she had the leverage to be able to say, I'm taking my son with me. And there's nothing I could do about it. I couldn't be like, no, you couldn't do that. At this point, I was also not very sure whether if she called the police, what, I, what could I do? You know, I'd heard about all these stories about men who were estranged from their wives or girlfriends. And when things got a little bit heated, the cops would arrive and men would often end up in the divi van and being a black man, I'm a shitless scared of that, you know, because it starts a chain of events. You just sometimes can't reverse. So I'd give in, I'd capitulate on every, on every argument. I'd be like, you know what? I'll capitulate because there's a better chance I'll see my child. And there's a better chance that maybe in a week's time, you'd be more willing to have a conversation that is, you know, more grounded and willing for us to listen to each other. So she moved to Sunshine and, this, and I was still in Reservoir in the north close to La Trobe University. And I lived there for another two years, but I would commute every second day. If I could, some weeks I went every day after work, I'd commute to Sunshine. I'd spend the evening with him and her if she was willing, or I'd take him out for a walk and bring him back. And then I'd commute back to Reservoir and then to work the next morning. So every day or every second day, I just went to sunshine, <laughs> became a ritual, you know, sometimes I'd miss the train, the last train, cause I'd linger there and then I'd like put him to bed and want to sleep in his bed. And then I'd fall asleep and wake up and I'd sprint to the train and it would just, just be leaving. So I'd have to like, you know, walk to one place and take the last bus, which was how, you know, just end up at home at like two, three AM only to wake up at five or six AM the next morning to go and do a call center job, you know? Like Brighton, hello, how are you? Phil speaking. <laughs> so I repeat, I repeat, I repeat. And during this time, I was just using more and more yoga. Like every time I got really angry, yoga, yoga. And then back to where I was, met Rachel. And she started doing yoga as a way to, I suppose she's, she got called, called into it. Her mother, her grandmother, sorry, did yoga, has been doing yoga since she was young. And she's like 90 something now, still does it. You should have her in here. Mm -hmm. Her grandmother's amazing. And so she inspired her to some degree, but I also think Rachel was, had, has a, a natural disposition for the yasana. Very flexible, very strong, very yang energy, you know? Nothing is too scary for her to try. And so we started going to studios together. And it was the first time I was in a studio. And at first I was a little perturbed because being fairly poor for Australian standards, 
I'd walk into places and they were very opulent, like with the doors or like just everything smelt richer than I was. And it would really perturb me. But I still enjoyed what I got out of the practice, right? So there was this, again, a dystopia between opulence and humility. You know, like the practice of, of yoga is about humbling yourself and bringing yourself down a peg, you know? And then I'd enter these places that really felt like really opulent to me. And that wasn't the case. It was just my own internal issues, my own problems to some degree. Some of them are very, very opulent. Like there's no, there's no way of mincing the words. But I think the ones I was going to when I first started weren't as opulent as I thought they were, probably because I'd never been to a first world studio. You know, I'd, I was, I'd been to India, a shala in India, and they don't give a damn. <laughs> <laughs> Floor space, enjoy. <laughs> Place to make tea at best, you know. Often not even a mash. No, that's right. Not even a, not even a mat. So when I came when I came to those places, I found it. Really, but then it allowed me to to start a, a, a rhythm and to meet people who were teaching. Hello, Ran here. I just wanted to talk a little bit about the future of the Flow Artist Podcast. We mentioned this on our Patreon page a while ago, but we've decided to change things around here just a little bit. We really love creating the podcast, but it does take up a lot of our time. So we're going to let go of the fortnightly schedule after episode 100. This is currently episode 97. And we've also decided that we probably won't focus on yoga quite as much. We really just want to speak with individuals that we're passionate about in a more diverse sphere. Episode 100 will be a very special episode where we get to reminisce about the past three years and we're going to experiment a little and try live streaming it. So look out for that very soon. We'll have more information coming up for you. All right, let's get back to our conversation with Phil. And did you feel like the teachers were welcoming? Like even though the architecture might have been intimidating, did you feel like the community accepted you or was some there place, a little place, bit of... Some places. Majority of them, not so much. Specific ones, and I work there. <laughs> Ironically, no. <laughs> well, making the change. I know. I, know. <laughs> I was like, I like this energy. I'll be there, you know. And some of the places that felt a little opulent to me, actually over time, I found they had a sense of community. Some I just wasn't connected to, and I don't work there. I don't, I just, I don't practice there. Not out of hatred, but just out of the fact that our energies don't align and it's okay to respect somebody, but keep them at an arm's distance. Yeah. So I, I, while I was with Rachel and when we first met, I was still together now, but when we first met, I started doing more and more yoga and I started to realize that it's something I really enjoy doing. And then the prospect of it being something that someone can earn money from was bewildering to me. It's like, wait a second, these people wake up and they go and do yoga. Like they teach people yoga and they get paid for it. What do they do after that? It's like, I mean, more yoga. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you can pay their bills with this? Someone's like, yeah, yeah, they can. Like genuinely. I was like, this is what I've, I've been working towards this my entire life. So I thought, all right, I want to go to more class, more class, more class, more class, and really understand what this is in my own body and, and see if I can really make a go of it. But it took me a long time. It took me maybe two years before I decided, okay, I think I'm going to go for this and then teacher training. So I've been practicing at the Australian Yoga Academy for a while. Rachel had taken me there and it had a reputation, still does. And I arrived and there was a versatile number of teachers and they had a teacher training that seemed quite comprehensive. But also I think sometimes when I see something and it's available to me, I don't like look too far away. In hindsight, there's so many other things I could have done. I'm grateful and honored. In fact, I'd still make the same decision to do that same course. But whether I would have done it as the first course is a different thing altogether. So I think that's also people who aspire to be teachers is deciding how you want to enter it. Because sometimes you can dysregulate your how you feel. The first course can really change the way you feel. And that course is fairly like, you know, intensive. And a lot of people thrive. Like any any educational setting, some people thrive, some people don't. So I went into this and... Before I did, though, I had all these savings that I'd put aside. <laughs> and that those savings had come from the interim period between when I separated from Jess to when I met Rachel. 
in that time, I saw no one else. I didn't date. I didn't. And that period, I was an escort. And so it was a very different life. On top of the call center work, I'd do every now and then I'd be an escort and I'd, I'd meet up with women, couples, all sorts of things. And I suppose my sexual inhibitions are very, very reduced because I come from a country that doesn't have hang-ups as far as that's concerned. So I found myself doing something that I knew was morally and, and, and the value of it would be very difficult for my family to understand. But as time progressed, I started to realize that no, I didn't, actually didn't care. <laughs> I met a really amazing people. I earned a lot of money. And I learned more about my myself more than anything else. I can't quantify, even though it was a lot of money, I can't quantify the money I made with the experience about myself. Not necessarily about sexuality or anything per se, but the way I behave in that context, the way I treat people, how it changed me when I was getting paid for it, and how those same qualities could actually be transferred into my non-paid intimacy. And I also really, really empathize for women during that period because I, I saw a lot of women who had been through relationships that were really, really difficult. And they saw their bodies as, they didn't even look at themselves as people anymore. And so they have the abyss to let somebody trust you enough to open up to you that way and leave with a sense of confidence. And you feel like, oh, I've done something good for somebody, but it's not tangible. Yes, there's money exchanged. But what takes place is different for every from every experience. So you can't really quantify the experience with the money. It's just, that's just the way it works. After a while, I stopped and I thought, okay, I've made the money I need. I've experienced what I can. I think it's time to switch off and go back to being a person who interacts with people and, and has sex without being paid for it. And not long after, I met Rach. I started the yoga journey. And then I started to realize that everything I'd done as an escort and dealing with people, how it, the lay of that land and how it had to lend into holding space for people in yoga. And then I went for my teacher training, took some of that escorting money and put a huge portion of it into my teacher training. So I just redirected those finances, paid for my debts, whatever was left, teacher training. All of it was gone. But I thought I'm now invested in something that I can make a career. I was sick of jobs. And I wanted something I could wake up to. Even if someone told me I couldn't get paid, would I still do it once a day? Yep, that's for me. So I paid the money that for the teacher training at AYA. Never regret it again. I'm a teacher. Sorry, facilitator. I am, I'm gravitating more to that word. I don't consider myself really a teacher per se. I facilitate space for people to get to know themselves and to cultivate the teacher within them. So that's really what yoga is about. And then I, during that teacher training, I met Joe Buick. Goodness me, I don't even know the word to explain. <laughs> Joe, she's just a, an angel, heaven sent, you know, like the amount of things that Joe does to facilitate other people living full lives is on, like, I think in a few years, I'm going to nominate her for like Australian of the year. Like, like I have to, someone has to, you know, because she does amazing things. And then Karina Smith, also such, those are the probably the two people that really inspired me to go down the way I hold space and the way I facilitate. Those are the two main teachers. And then of course you have Dominique Salerno and you have Melanie also at, um, at uh, AYA. You've got a range of teachers who are really, really like inspiring. But for me, the trauma informed yoga approach was my bread and butter. I felt like that's where I want to go. So I found myself always contacting like Joe and Karina and, and shortly after I, I did the course with Karina, the yin, uh, mindful yin, mindfulness and yin. And inside a whole chain of events with my, with uh, trauma informed yoga. And then, yeah, now that's like, I love that. You know, every, every time I hold space or facilitate, it's about allowing people to feel safe. Safety for me is a key. Once you make someone feel safe, I think they do things in their own way, you know? And so, I'm just grateful now I'm full-time single dad. I've had Sevi now since he was six. But when he turned six, <laughs> life is interesting. He started getting ticks. He started saying like rolling in the back of his head. And I'd be like, what's going on there? And then his eyes would just kind of roll in the back of his head. At one point I was like, Sevi, do, do you think you can avoid doing that? Otherwise it will keep happening. And he just says, I can't stop. I was like, hmm. Two weeks later, started making a noise along with the eye roll 
at this point, I started to get really worried, you know, all sorts of things like, does my kid have a tumor like in his brain? Like what the hell's going on? So I go into doctors and they're always dismissive. Oh no, it's a small tick. And like, well, I've been reading, I've been watching my son when he's stressed, when he's a little anxious, like his body starts to move and he can't control it. And his eyes, I just really feel like we need to send me to a specialist so that they can really look into it. And if it isn't, fair enough, I don't mind, but at least try. And they'd be like, no, no, you're, you're fanciful. Don't, don't, don't. They wouldn't even give you a referral. Nah. Wow. No. Nah. Do you think there was an element of racism involved? No, I think probably being a young father, there is uh, ageism and also sexism. So it's interesting. It's like our dad doesn't know what he's talking Pretty about. Pretty much. You'd think it's racism, but actually there was no intention here in terms of racism. It was more about ageism and sexism. And I've experienced that being a dad the entire time. Because I'm a very involved father. I spend time with my child all the time. So much so that my entire life is predicated around him. Uh, I, my, my teaching schedule is around about how much time I can spend with him. And so being a dad, I've spent time around moms. Like really well to do moms, really not so well to do moms, but moms. And I've always been the young dad. And sometimes it's been an older dad. And the way I've been treated as a young dad, and in some cases, not so often, but in some cases, a young black dad creates a lot of angst inside of me because, you know, I get left out, you know, like kind of like hemmed out and moms will be talking and there is no opportunity to, you know, because I can't jump into the circle without any prompting. I'm not that kind of person going to be like, hey, hi guys, how you doing? You know, <laughs> kind of sit on the outskirts and if somebody gives me a look, I'm like, hi, I wave. But all the looks were like, don't bother kind of thing. And so I got used to kind of going, fine, I'll figure out myself, figure out myself. And then Sevi over time, got the symptoms. And then Rachel's father is a doctor. So I reached out to him. And then he actually started the ball rolling. And he sent Sevi to a specialist at the Royal Children's Hospital. By this time, I knew it was Tourette's because he was ticking and jerking and sleeping two hours at a time and then waking up because of a tick. And when it first started, it was like hell. Like it literally feels like a child's being possessed by something because you can't, you can't foretell when it's going to come. You can't predict. You can't stop it. You don't know how long it's going to go for. You don't know how intense it's going to be. And you don't know which body parts are going to move and for how long. So you're constantly in a state of anxiety, just waiting and waiting. And when it happens, you're waiting and waiting. It's just a waiting game. So I've cried so many times holding him in bed. I've cried myself to sleep because I'm just so sad that my child, I can't relieve his, his pain or his, this freaking thing, you know? And then we went to a specialist, the Royal Military, the Royal, Military, the Royal Children's Hospital. And yeah, he was diagnosed with uh, Tourette's, ADHD, and OCD. And we asked, because his mother, obviously, I, I always try to involve her in these things, even though he's now in my care full time. He sees his mom whenever. So she's welcome to come and grab him if she's feeling well or has the time and feeling motivated. Despite our issues, I never want to limit her access to her son or her son to her. So, yeah. And now, five years later, four years later, almost five, uh, Sevi's managing his ticks fairly well. Decided not to go down the medication path because I feel his brain chemistry will do what it needs to do. He's able to walk and play and laugh and do everything else, except now we're able to kind of go, this will end. You know, it's like we've had them so many times. It's like it happens. Sometimes we even make fun of some of the ticks, provided he's chill about it. Sometimes he'll do one. He's like, dad, did you hear that? <laughs> I'm like, I did. <laughs> it's like, I wait till it comes back. It's a really interesting one. And then, and then I'll be cooking or something and he does it again. Dad, did you hear it? I'm like, yeah, I did. <laughs> We've made music to some of his tics. Just um, normalizing it. Yeah. Yeah. And but also teaching you how to communicate with people about it. Not to be shy, to tell people, hi, um, I have Tourette's. It's involuntary. And if you don't understand what that means, don't sneeze. <laughs> don't blink. And so at his school, I speak to his school every year. First his class, I sit them down and I give them a bunch of real life scenarios to make them understand what Sevi is going through. But I also give them coping mechanisms in case they're unable to cope with what Sevi is going through himself. And then I offer his teachers options to, to help his education. I create a, as open a communication channel as I can with his teachers. Outside of the support he needs, he needs to be treated like any other child. So he's special, but also not special. We don't live on the predication that he has a disability. He's differently abled. 
And one of the analogies that I share with other parents who have kids with Tourette's is you've got to kind of make it like a superpower kind of thing. You know, with him, especially it's, it's a narrative. And I tell him that he's full of this spirit and this energy and his body sometimes finds it difficult to contain that energy. And we love comics. So there's so many analogies we can use there where superheroes are finding it difficult to contain their energy and they're about to explode. And the recent Avengers, the Infinity War, you know, with the gauntlet and being able to, and the hammer, that's really been good for us. And for me to kind of rationalize that notion. So every time it comes up, he just lets it out. It's like, if I don't exhaust this, I'll explode. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) Yeah. And do you give him that sort of, I guess, mindfulness, sort of noticing it kind of background as well? Yeah. Yeah. I communicate openly, but I'm also, we we have sun breath. So uh, we have one way he he uses his hand. And as he, he goes up the line, we use his index finger over his thumb and he'll breathe in up the thumb, breathe out, down the thumb, breathe in up the index finger, breathe down. So you just repeat that a few times. That only works so much. Sometimes it takes just really intense. And in that time, what we do is we just go out and be active. We get out and walk the dog or we get on the bike and we ride or we wrestle or just nerf guns and shoot each other. Just get our head and do things because for him, I think doing things kind of just disassociates from that notion of sitting and also we're ruminating on the fact that you're ticking doesn't change anything. So if you can use that ticking energy, wow, if you fall over while you're running because of a tick, that's one thing, pick yourself up, keep running. But your brain chemistry is pushing it around, which to some degree will supersede the need to tick. So the more we do that, the better it will be because he's very high functioning, high energy boy. So the only way I'm ever able to get him to do mindful things is straight after bed. So I also have two mats in my room, side by side, and he comes to my room every morning without fail. And if I've gone to work, sometimes I'll leave him the 6 a.m. class and I'll be back home by like quarter past seven. It's not very long at all. And I'll find him in my bed and I'll be like, yoga. And he's like, no, dad. (laughs) I'm like, just 10 minutes. And we'll do very basic things, cat cows, things that anybody could do really, lunges that reflections, twists, child's pose, we're done. And we do that every second day or every day. And now when I go sevi yoga, he's like, oh, okay, fine. Let's get it over and done with. But you can see his body starting to change. You can even see his breathing starting to change. But more importantly, you can see the way he's able to deal with, with the dysregulation. He has a place inside of him that he can go to outside of the breathing, outside of the everything where he's kind of able to go back and just become an observer. And that's what I've always told him, like, Go to your safe place and observe. Imagine that you're that you're just watching people and see how they behave and it will teach you. And talking about using silence as a good way to learn what's taking place around you. But having a dad who facilitates yoga, I think he gets mindfulness up to his ears. You know? Like even when I'm not talking to him, there's people in my building that I'm always like talking mindfulness to or inviting people in the building, come do yoga, you know, like it's his life. He spends time with me in school holidays. He comes with me to every class because I don't have anyone else. I can, I don't have mom, dad, brother, sisters, cousins, just me and him here. His mom's family is fairly estranged from us because his mother had a tiff with the family. And so they've distanced themselves from us and her. And as a result, he has literally no cousin. Like he does have cousins, but they don't interact with him. And it's because of the isolation of their sister and her mental health. You, know, you have to make a choice when it comes to mental health, support or like disassociate. And it's sad because the intermittent support from her parents, but her siblings have disassociated with her completely. And despite being separate, separated from her, I still make it a thing to support her take my son to see her, open my home for her to see her son, remind her that the mental health doesn't define who she is. It's just a portion of who she is. And we all have our demons, just that hers is much more open to the world. A lot of us have demons we're able to exercise in the comfort of our own homes. But those of us who don't have the chance to do that, where it just comes up unexpectedly, those are the people that are vilified, you know, because we don't know and it's hard because I've had friends who I've had actually also had to distance myself because especially being a parent, I've got to realize that I can only give my energy to so many people. And because I'm so drawn to mental health and mindfulness, that's one of the things that has now become a huge part of my life as of recent, that notion of how many people can I give my energy and telling or 
letting people know that I don't have the energy to give them and that I need to prioritize elsewhere. Otherwise, I'll have none left for me has been a big thing for me recently. And it was very interlinked to my social media, very interlinked to my public persona, which has been a, a under review over the last two years or so. And the more I do this work, the more I realize I, I didn't want an image. I didn't want a pedestal. I, I wanted to be somebody who could just make people feel safe. And so I started moving away from a lot of the things that I, I started, that I really got into when I first started yoga, blue lemon clothes and, and the mats and the, the right schedules and the perfect teacher and the perfect time and the, the big classes, you know, and it has a drawing to it. Don't get me wrong. It's, Rue Lemon was awesome to me. Like, you know, they gave me opportunities to do some really cool things and they're a really nice organization. At least to me, they were. I, I'm not going to go into the whole what's going on with them, but I can only speak for myself. And I always like to emphasize that, that you can have reservations, but also speak truthfully about your own experiences. And with them, I really have no arguments as, as far as my own personal experience is concerned. But I started to realize that the grassroots part of yoga is so essential the people that come in and feel like they don't belong. Like those are the people who really need it. You know, not the person who can afford a, a yoga mat and already has a Lululemon outfit, has a subscription to a studio. I love those people. I still hold space and facilitate people who already have that. But I think I'm much more fulfilled when I offer and hold space for somebody who was initially upset with yoga or who felt like they couldn't do it or felt like their body wasn't worth it. That's really where yoga is useful for me. So that's, that's my life. I do have another question of for course. you, kind of two different questions of about course. social media. Sure. And the first one is, I think I tell myself this and other yoga teachers tell themselves this, that like you can't opt out because you need it for your business and that's how you're going to fill your classes. Right. Have, what, have you noticed any change since you completely stopped doing it? Yes, I have. I've realized that I find joy in the class of one. I'm less worried about how many people are in my class, how many people are going to be in my class. I don't even look at, and if I go look at the roster of how many people have booked into the class, is often I'll look at it just as a way to familiarize and I go, oh, I know him. Oh, I know her. Oh, I'm excited, you know? Or I don't know any of these people. I want to make an inherent effort to remember their names, to create a narrative and a relationship with them. Never five people, yay. 20 people, yay. Half a person. <laughs> if there's any such thing, yay. <laughs> there's been times where no one's arrived because there's a bunch of studios who I'm not going to name because they're struggling. And that always doesn't necessarily work well for in a business standpoint, but I'm still facilitating with the studios because I believe in the notion of community. What I'm getting out of it financially doesn't equate the amount of time I'm putting into it. But what comes of it is that the people who come to these classes are people who are generally would feel isolated. There's l less access to yoga around them compared to us here in Northcote or in Paran or St. Kilda. So when I'm there at 6 a.m. in the morning and I know I'm not making much money, I leave, I, I always literally, this is actually going to be really funny. I arrive sometimes in the morning and I'm, I'm, I'm questioning myself. I've left my son in bed. I'm going to this place that's actually further than any other studio I work at. I don't think they'll be able to pay me for this class and four people are going to arrive. So I, and I'm just thinking about it, thinking about it. And I go, Phil, just relax, relax. Just go, just go and hold space. At the end of the class, not once do I ever justify that conversation in my head. At the end, I'm like, yep, I'll be back next week. <laughs> 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 you know, because, uh, and that's why the whole social media thing for me, I think had disassociated me from the true work of this. There is usefulness in social media, but for me, I couldn't, I couldn't delineate the usefulness and the addiction. And also like sometimes I'd be doing things on for the purpose of posting them. Not that I'd done things that I wanted to post. You know what I mean? And so that flipping of, of ideas of, am I really going out to enjoy my time or am I going out to collect memories to share with the rest of the world? 
I I think I like found your social media in the brief window that you were the, back yeah. because I was like, there's so much beautiful poetry here. Mm. So a lot of what you share was your thoughts, your feelings, your yeah. creativity. Yeah. Are you finding now that that's not going on Instagram, you're more creative in other ways? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. My creative juices, energy as are being placed elsewhere with people. So to put it bluntly, I decided I was not going to engage with social media anymore. I wanted to engage with people. I wanted to be in the presence of people. I wanted to, to have, you know, have somebody disagree with me physically, not have a war of words or not that I was really that kind of person. Everything I often posted was, an op- I would say it was an opinion, but I also was delineated that it was uh, just a suggestion and people could choose. And this is like what I still do when I hold space. Everything I say in in class is always a suggestion. It only becomes yoga if it makes sense in your body. Beyond that, it's complete hogwash, right? I'm a GPS. You can just ignore me at any point, <laughs> you know? And if you lose your way, check in again. These are the, these are the analogies I utilize whenever I'm facilitating. I want to steal that. Yeah. <laughs> Adopt it. Yeah. So by all means, you know, it's, it's one of those things that I, I feel every person should take. And it's useful to all of us. not a theft. It's an adoption of a useful term. And for me, over over time, that disconnection, because I've gone a year, next month will be a year of social media. Haven't posted, haven't read other people's posts, haven't liked, literally haven't touched it. And I, I set myself a promise, almost like quitting smoking or something. I just went, I'm not going to touch until a year's time. And the year where everyone spent more time on the internet <laughs> than any other year. <laughs> That's right. And I thought it's really just interesting. And during that year, I rode hundreds of kilometers. I ran hundreds of kilometers. I did hundreds of hours of yoga, hundreds of hours of Pilates on my phone, hundreds of hours of hit. Like I have more time with my dog. I spend time just staring into her eyes. You know, my son and I watch the goofiest things together. You know, I, I find that whenever I have free time, I'm just reading or staring at the wall. And I find more usefulness out of staring at the wall I'm trying to engage in what the rest of the world's population is doing for me. And I want to emphasize that anyone hearing this, sometimes if you're on social media or whatever, there is this notion that somebody else quitting, it needs to be your path. That's not the truth. We all know what's good for us inside. We can feel it. You can feel it when something is overtook you, you know, or you feel like it's of use to you. And it's important to always be congruent to that internal voice. And a year ago, that internal voice told me, get off. Three weeks ago, it told me, get off altogether. So, and I, I have no qualms with it. If there a, comes a time for me to change my mind, I reserve that right to do so. Instagram's not going anywhere. <laughs> and the internet is a, is a, if you really want it, you can find my posts. They're out there somewhere in the ether. You know, there's always people I was connected to. So if I really wanted to find them, I could. But what I was sharing is already available. Those people who read it in the moment, they read it. That's who I was reaching out to. Anyone who didn't read it, it wasn't meant to arrive. So it's accepting what you can and can't control. And then to be here, I think that's my priority now, just to be here. Otherwise, my life will come to an end. And now all I remember of it will be a two by something square screen. And I don't want that. (laughs) Fair enough. <laughs> Have you noticed that your relationship with your son changed, not having your phone? He actually made made light of it because he was like, Dad, you're always on Instagram. Because I'd be like, Sivy, say something, you know, you try and get your child involved. He's like, no, nah, I don't want to say something. I'd be like, why? And he'd be like, because I don't want to. And I'd be like, yeah, why am I trying to involve you in something you don't want to? Especially, why am I exposing you to the rest of the world? They just so they can tell me how cute you are, so they can like it and and validate my how cute my child is, you know. Unless I see the vanity in it, and I hate vanity. Like I try to live my if I could tattoo it on my forehead, I would. But humility is one of the one of the qualities I really gravitate to, and I always exercise and, and practice humility. So whenever I feel like I'm being vain, I run the opposite direction. <laughs> Yeah. So Sevi definitely made me aware of, of the social media, but also is now more aware of how present I am. So he could be gaming because gaming is one of the tactile ways we've found that can help him with his tics and also to focus. 
to communicate. He's got a headset. He's got a community to be a part of. Sometimes they argue. Sometimes they're best friends. He makes weird friends and then cuss him out. They come back and I'm in the kitchen either reading, <laughs> you know, drawing, playing my guitar, just doing something basic in the other room. So I'm not always with him, but I can hear him. Compared to a year ago, I get involved now. I hear him say that. I'm like, Seb, you can't say that. You can't treat someone like that. Or well, I hear the narrative of the conversation he's having with his friends. I'm actually able to keep, keep in touch with it, even though I'm doing other things. But when I was on my phone, it would just be me on my phone. I, I, he could be right next to me having a conversation and I couldn't hear him. A year later, I could be cooking, watching a TV show, you know, feeding the dog, like all sorts. And I'll still be able to tell what's going on. Like my mom could. You know, and so all those, all those other things are very, very different to me than social media. It has a visceral biological, you know, biochemistry that it changes in your mind. And for me, I think it overpowered me. So I suppose I'm too weak and I acknowledge that weakness and I'm okay with it. <laughs> yeah. I'm definitely too weak in that regard. <laughs> Me too. We try and do no social media Sundays and... That's fallen to the wayside a little bit. <laughs> some of us. Yeah, maybe for me, yes. Yeah, yeah. What I've also been doing and in the most low stakes way possible is when I wake up first thing in the morning, I always meditate before I look at my phone. Yeah. And so sometimes that just means I fall back to sleep. <laughs> that's okay too. Yeah, that's fine. And that's the thing, you know, like without... Without social media, this wouldn't access the people who need it. I wouldn't be such a big fan, flow artist, if social media didn't exist. The number of people you've had on this and the wealth of knowledge that, and, and wisdom they've, sh- they've shared, but also both of you to be able to hold space. You're such both great holders of space, you know, because you have all these people come in and, and they speak and they speak candidly. It's because there's a sense of trust, you know? So, with this, I want you to, to keep going, you know, because there is value in this. And that's where you've got to be able to delineate where you get, it's okay to have a little addiction to something that gets so much out of, all right? But if you're well addicted and there's very little coming out of it, you've really got to make that opportunity cost. And for me, it's about the opportunity cost. What am I losing to gain something? Well, I think we actually, like when we first started doing this, realized how rare it was to sit down with someone and just have a conversation, Mm -hmm. to not look at a phone and to not even be eating or doing those other like little life distraction things, (laughs) but to like fully be present with people. And that's like a real gift that the podcast has given us. And when we used to do it, like afterwards, I would actually feel quite tired like that hour of focusing was like, oh, all right, I think I'm done for the afternoon. <laughs> but, yeah. um, yeah, no, it, and sometimes it feels like a meditation as well and everything that you've shared has been so fascinating and so heartfelt that we've just been on the ride. Like I don't feel like we've hardly had to ask you any yeah, questions. We've, we've got a whole sheet of questions here and I, I think we've asked like two or three. So, no, <laughs> that's that's okay. I think I went on a bit of a ramble. Oh, no, oh, no, <laughs> that's what we live for. That's what a podcast is all about. Yeah. And I think as well it's, that sense of it's such a privilege to be able to share with someone the things in their life that they're the most passionate about and the things that really mean something to them and their life's journey that's got them to this particular place. You don't normally have those kind of conversations with people, especially if it's the first time that you're meeting them. Yeah, so that's true. it's pretty awesome. Yeah. It's like, I suppose it's that circuit, you know, it's that, that giving and getting at the same time. And you can feel it because you hold the space and, you know, it's almost like a cathartic, you know, here's my life. (laughs) (laughs) And then I think for people listening as well, like I know when I listen to podcasts, because they're right in your ears, it's different to watching TV when you're looking at a screen. Yeah. Yeah. That's very true. Yeah. Actually, that's, that's true. And it's, it sounds more like a conversation and and less like a, like something happening far away from you that someone else made. You feel like you're there. Yeah. And it's actually really interesting because podcast, something I've always wanted to get into, but for the life of me, I've got the worst way of arranging my life. You know? <laughs> Sounds like you've got a lot of other things that you got going on. <laughs> I think, you know, it's that altruism. I've always wanted to achieve and do more and more and more. And also, I think that's also something that we personally I have to work on, you know, knowing it's not about, for me, it's not about remuneration. It's about value tangent like feeling that sense of like what do you call it of service it's like you know when you 
do something that makes you feel like you're of service or it increases your value. And the more of those things you come in contact with, the more of them you want. So, yeah. I think it might be a little bit of a flip side of what you're saying, how much you really value humbleness. Because in my mind, humbleness and service really go together and yeah. you live for what you can do for other people. That's right. And so that value of humbleness kind of drives you to the point where you might, you know, just that's, empty your own batteries giving to other people. Whereas if you true. were just a little bit more arrogant and like kept <laughs> back, you're like, I'm sweet. I don't need to do things for other people. Like yeah. that's, yeah. I think with all of those values, there's like the real strength in it, but then there's also that, I guess, shadow side to yeah. watch out for and to know that tendency in yourself and to know when you're like, okay, this doesn't have to be another project. That's like, right. Me and Ron definitely are like way too good yeah. at giving ourselves new projects. <laughs> <laughs> we get really excited at the beginning and then we get really cranky because we don't have days off. So, yeah. It's noticing it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, you know, and that's, that's exactly what you're doing. That's mindfulness. You know, it's not about one of the, probably the best things I've repeated to myself for ages now. And it came up when I was in Shavasana one day and that, that was that yoga in its, in its own right is just about noticing. It's not about, it's like paragraphs. So you've got paragraphs and then punctuation and life is filled with paragraphs, but the samadhi, you know, wisdom is the commas and the full stops. Those moments where you look at a flower and it looks more beautiful than it's ever been or your cat climbs on you on that moment of despair or or you open the fridge and you realize, oh, I probably need to go my go get more things because I need to buy, you know, get make dinner for that person I love. That's really the wisdom, I think. And the more I've come to terms with this, the more I've realized that if you're not chasing this everlasting ex- ex- like expanded state of 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 wisdom, you're then able to kind of like accept that you're not always a wise person. And then it sets that, that tone of really noticing when things have happened and noticing, I think is such a key word because it allows people to fail and it allows people to know that failing is actually part of the process. And you're also allowed to choose to change your mind. But all this comes with that notion of knowing that you are enough, you know, like you're more than enough. And the process of learning and growing is just filled with so much crap, you know, and, and your crap is just as heavy as somebody else's. Yeah, and I think that's really what yoga is. It's not, it's not this altruistic, everlasting state. And every time I see people who exude that, who want to always seem put together, it it frustrates me because as people hold space, you know, really need to humanize ourselves. And the more we do that, the more people come. The more you know, the more people feel like they can do it too. And that's my drive. That makes me really, really happy. <laughs> Beautiful. Flowing on from that, I was we just did an accessible yoga online training in lockdown and I was just like catching up on the extra videos and Jivana Heyman had a really beautiful explanation for what yoga is and it's making friends with your own mind. Yeah, 100%. Very much so. Yeah. So, much better explanation. No, that. I think this is really beautiful. I think they go together <laughs> is, really well. It's like I knowing think, yourself and understanding yeah. yourself and sometimes a bit of tough love with yourself. Yeah. But, you know, you've got to be on your own team. 100%. You tend your own fire. Yeah. You know, it's going to help somebody else's fire, but don't forget to keep tending your own. Otherwise, you know, it will go out and then you're going to be trying to grab other people's heat. (laughs) And it's interesting as well because sometimes, like, if you're feeling useless or, like, life doesn't have meaning, helping someone else is, like, the way back into feeling, like, love for life and feeling like you do have something worthwhile to contribute to the world. So it's, like, that balance of, like, giving but also... Yeah. Receiving, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Being, yeah. And that, that's the duality, you know, of knowing how much you're taking and how much you're willing to give. Sometimes when you're empty, you can fill your, your own cup up by giving to other people. So you go and you spend time with somebody who's less able to, like, I do this quite a lot. I go to calls and I'll buy a few basic things, especially when I walk past somebody who's, you know, wants cash or is really struggling. I'll go in and I'll grab a bunch of staples like bread or by like, you know, like a little bit of that uh, milk that's not the fridge, the other one, the long life milk. Maybe just like a few things, small things that I'd probably carry with me if I didn't have a, a you know, a steady, a steady home. And, and I'll walk up to them. I'll be like, Hey, does any of this look interesting to you? Like, would you like any of this stuff? 
And majority of the time they're like, yeah, all that stuff would be useful. And I'm like, well, here you go. Like, I hope that helps. And I'll walk off and because I'm not so sure what they require, but I can give what I can. And I'm a rich man, but I know that I can afford to offer something or offering yoga class to people I meet in the park. There's a few people who I've met in the park playing my drum and like, what's that drum? Like, it's just a drum. What do you do? Yoga. Oh, I've always wanted to try that, but I'm a smoker and I do drugs and uh, my life's not together. I'm like, come now. Like, yeah, you can sit on my mat. I'll sit in the grass and let's just do some stretches. Get it on your back, put your knees to your chest. A couple of twists here, there. 30 minutes in, 45 minutes in, we're done. That felt good, man. Just went 45 minutes off drugs, man. <laughs> well done. Have a good day. I'll never see you again. But I've become such a serial offer. I offer yoga everywhere. Like, like it's actually some people are probably going to like <laughs> call them. That guy is always offering yoga everywhere for free. Because <laughs> some people don't have the means, the time. And sometimes now is the right time. Like if I don't have much to do and somebody approaches me, asks me what I do, why direct them to a studio when I can do it for them now and here? Especially when you've had the experience yourself of walking into a studio and not feeling welcome and feeling intimidated to even walk in that That's door. That's right. That's right. So it's a process. It really is. Yeah. So it's been, it's been an interesting one. And like always, my whole life is revolved around my child. So every time are I'm you um, things, looking at the school pickup time? <laughs> that's right, and that's that's literally been my whole life. Phil, can you work this time? Uh, I don't know. I'll be picking up my. Son. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do have just one more question. So I guess if you could distill everything that you've learned and everything that you teach down to one core essence, what yeah. do you think that one thing would be? Acceptance, accepting everybody as they are, even the people you don't understand are always an opportunity of wealth and knowledge. I do this because I realize that everyone else is me and I am them. I just need to remind myself that. But again, as always, the the theme of my life is to be humble and to and to accept everyone and to and to offer what I can, to accept when I can't, to be truthful about that. Because there's been times in class where I can't put the words together and I acknowledge it. I'm like, today my mouth is not doing for so well. Or, oh, I forgot that. Which side were we on again? Just acknowledge those things. So yeah, my whole ethos is to to really ground myself, humanize myself, and make myself accessible to every person that reaches me, reaches out to me, speaks to me, and to speak to everyone with a, a level of truthfulness and respect to remind people that I'm no different from them. Everything that they may aspire for, that they see in me, is exactly already there in them. Like we all have a wise teacher inside of us. And that teacher can can supersede somebody who's been doing it. Like you could start yoga today and acquire more in in five years than somebody who's been doing it for 20 years. There's no knowing unless you give it a try. And so the suggestion that watching somebody that you you uh, that you really revere, there's 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 no guarantee that you can't be better than them in in understanding that the notion. No, not better than them, but different, I suppose. It's like we all acquire different things at different times, but everyone is capable of this. And that's my mantra. And um, they just have to give it a go. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for everything that you've shared and also for journeying to our house because it's <laughs> such an honor to actually get to sit down with you mm. after I loved coming many here. Zoom conversations. Yeah, <laughs> I, I love Northgate, but also I love your home. Oh, you know? thanks. Well, you're welcome back anytime. Yeah, I come back with a huge platter of African food. Oh, oh. yes. <laughs> you like two dishes because that's all I can make. <laughs> I always say that people are like, wow, what else? I'm like, it's literally like flour <laughs> and something sauce. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, thank you. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Phil. He's had such a fascinating journey. My jaw was on the floor for a lot of the conversation. You might notice we didn't really have to ask that many questions. If you'd like to share your thoughts on the interview or anything else, please feel free to get in touch. You can join us on our Facebook group, the Flow Artist Podcast community, and drop us a message there. Or leave us some feedback on our Instagram pages. I'm Ran Loves Yoga and Joe is Garden of Yoga. You can also email us at podcast at flowartist.com. We would love to hear from you. Our next episode will also be very special. It's a conversation with Richard 
Litiket. Richard has been teaching yoga for over 40 years and has also been Joe's art teacher since she was a child. He's got so much knowledge to share, including about the early days of the iconic Mangala Studios, and I've been really looking forward to speaking with him. So look forward to that episode in a couple of weeks' time. Our theme song is Baby Robots by Go Soul and is used with permission. Get his music from gosoul.bandcamp.com. Thank you so, so much for listening. Joe and I really appreciate you spending your time with us. Aroha nui. Big, big love. Love.